Hello. So today we're going to do a uh, kind of an introductory to Input Shaper, and specifically we're going to be talking about uh, Shake Tune by FrixX, and kind of give a, an overview of all the different graphs and what they're telling us, what they're not telling us, and uh, basically how do we go about even start thinking about doing Input Shaper. Um, in on clipper so you know clipper has the built-in input shaper you can run the, the do the physical model um, that can be found real easy by i think it's measure resonance and clipper just google that uh, measuring resonance and then if you go to resonance compensation in clipper all right it'll, you can print this model here and it will bring up ringing patterns and you you can do this and it's i think it's valid to do it once or twice to understand it um but we can back up here and we can say what what is input shaping trying to do it's trying to counterbalance or counteract the natural ghosting ringing resonance patterns these wavy patterns you see on your on your prints so basically, it's going to put in a, a signal to the system that's opposite to this resonance to give you nice flat patterns with no ghosting on it after any sort of movements and stuff like that. So what, is, what does ShakeTune do that Clipper doesn't do? They do about the same, and it's just it's also packaging and the amount of information it gives you and how it gives it to you. So if you just want to do this with basic input, uh, Clipper pro, uh, apps or Clipper's um, built-in macros, you can. You'll get, you know, you follow this, it's under measuring residence. So you have residence compensation and measuring residence. And you'll come in here, it'll tell you how to configure your ADXL and all that. Um, so right here is be like how you configure your ADXL for yours. If you bought it, if you bought like a, a boxy, or a LDO input shaper, um, they'll usually come with instructions on what you need to add into it, into Clipper. But you'll, Clipper will give you these graphs, and these are usable. This is what I used before Fricks developed his, his, his shake tune, and it will give you the information you need. Does it give you all the information? And no, but it gives you enough that you can understand and, and use it. Um, so I'm not going to go into exactly how to do or how to install it and stuff like that. I'm more giving a breakdown, going to bring a breakdown of what it, what does it do? How do you read it? And how do the, all these graphs work together? So this is the main thing. There's another part, and, and I allude to it, it's called belt shaper. And in here, it's kind of tucked in here in the Clippers measure resonance documents. But if you keep going down, let's see, it, it's, a, it's a different axis. Like, how do you measure different axes? And it's right here, testing custom axes. This effectively is belt shaper. These are the commands you need to run belt shaper in Clipper. And it's just kind of tucked in here. It's above all the, below all that stuff, but before input shaping auto calibration. This will allow you to test only only your x and y axis it will not let you do a z axis so that means like uh, printers such as uh, switch wire ender wires any sort of bed slinger where the x and z are tied together you cannot use this now if you had something like a prusa with an independent x an independent y and independent z you could use this on that kind of system you just can't use it on a belted XZ or just any sort of XZ system. So let's go to ShakeTune then. And uh, they'll give us some, uh, some graphs. So you get three things, three options with ShakeTune. You get your belt graphs, which is also called belt shaper. You get your input shaper graphs, and you're going to get this vibration graph. And so the belt graphs will give you some information. So this is, let's just blow this up real big. Can we see that? We might need to make it bigger. Uh, how do we make it bigger? Zoom. Plus, plus. 
plus. Okay. So what does this tell you? Right? This is tell this is what this is gonna do, it's gonna run your A motor in a diagonal, because when A motor just runs by itself, your your tool head will move in a diagonal. So it's gonna do your diagonals. It's gonna run your A motor and then B motor, and you'll see the tool head slightly going about a millimeter, I think a millimeter or a half in a diagonal of the A motor, then it'll do a diagonal of the B motor. And this this is telling you it's gonna it's a it's a relative measurement. So when you tighten your belts, you use your tension tool or you use uh, the app, um, some sort of meter to measure that belt tension, right? For Vorons, it's 150 millimeters in, in, in spacing, and you want 110, 115 hertz. So this is basically taking that and it's giving you in graph form. And so what this is telling us though, this is not gonna give us the absolute, so it's not gonna tell us that A belt is at 110 hertz or B belts at 90 hertz. All it's doing is comparing the two belts together and saying, how does one belt resonate to the other belt? So this is what I call the fine tune of, belt, of, of the belts. So after you've, you've, make, you've put them on your printer and after you've coarse tuned them with your app or your, your tension tool, you run this and you're gonna get a fine tune. So what we can see here is that these belts align, and you want this, you're going to want this aligned in frequency, which is on the bottom, and in amplitude. Now, the amplitude numbers, they don't really have a meaning. There's no value per, for them, per se, but they're just as a comparison. Um, and what you'll see is you want these things to line up perfectly. It's not going to happen. You want them perfect. It's not going to happen. You're going to get something. So here we see there's an amplitude discrepancy. And what Frick says does is he says okay well we have peaks a and peaks b he matches these peaks up so if two peaks will match or they're close enough together he'll match them up and he'll tell you the delta so he'll give you the frequency delta saying look this this a peaks there's no difference in frequency and there's a 5.1 percent difference in delta and the b peak b peaks zero percent right here but there's a 25 percent 24.8 percent difference and he'll also should tell you what peaks have no friend? So this peak, this is maybe its friend, but right here, it's way up here. And then, so this is kind of the general idea. So in this graph, what I would do, just to just as a kind of a side, I tighten the B belt by an eighth, maybe a quarter of a turn. That's going to push out the, the frequencies now. It's going to make this belt go this way, but it'll also hopefully bring it up. So they're pretty good. If this is the best you could do, I would say it's fine, right? It would move, it'd move along. Well, one thing that uh, I'm going to repeat in, the, in another video, because this is part one, is that we don't want to chase unicorns. It is the biggest drawback. That it's What sucks people in and gets people all frustrated with, with this is they're looking for the perfect graph. Everything has to be perfect. I'm going to show you some of my own graphs later on. Uh, they, they are not perfect. So we're just kind of giving, giving an overview of what FrickSax does. So down here is your spectrogram, right? So basically, it's I like to think of it as the harmonics or, or the main frequency, and then you get some harmonics down here. What you can see, and when these are bold right here, that's like a lot of energy right there. So you can see that at 50 hertz for 40 seconds, right? This is a main peak. That's a main peak. And this is where your secondary or tertiary peak is. You want these, for a belt shaper, you just want one of these things. So you really don't want this whole line like this. And you can see down here, there's some other harmonics, right? You don't really want that. FrickSex gives you an a explanation of all this. So this is generally what belt shaper is going to be good for, right? It's, it's just a relative measurement between belts. That's all it tells you. Right. You can do limited troubleshooting on what's wrong with my system on belt shaper. But to really understand if it's a if it's a problem, you have to do input shaper. Now, another thing that belt shaper will, will kind of tell you is it'll tell you, like input shaper, what's happening at your diagonals. So if you ever have a print and you take a, a square box and you rotate it 45 degrees, all of your 
horizontal now. Your horizontal lines aren't along the A or, or the X or Y axis anymore. They're now diagonals. So this will kind of give you a little, little hint of what it's going to do when it's printing those diagonals. So if you get something really crazy, you might expect some... Um, you might expect some ghosting or resonance or ringing on the diagonals because this is a pure, these are pure diagonal movements. So they're kind of telling you what you're going to see a little bit, right? Limited troubleshooting. So that's belt, that's the belt shaper. Input shaper, and this is where all the excitement is, right? He tells you all the parameters you can use, but this is where all the excitement, everyone wants to talk about input shaper. So, this is what it gives you okay so what is this right let's go there's a lot going on here and we'll, we'll, we'll try and break it down in over here let me see if i can make it bigger so we can we can see it better okay so over here you got two legends you get the legends of of the signal here and you got the legends of the shapers so we can see that the purple is x you got so you back up now. Your accelerometer or your ADXL has three axes inside of it. It's got X, Y, and Z. And when you shake that accelerometer, one or all or some of those axes are going to vibrate. Right? So if you have this ADXL sitting on your tool head and you say move in X, only the X should vibrate. You shouldn't really see any y vibrations or z vibrations similarly when you excite your tool head in y you should only see y vibrations does that happen really no no all right this is this is kind of a pristine graph here and it's pristine because you're not seeing any x any y which is the the purple or the, the green i'm sorry you're not seeing any z which is way down here, that's the Z. And your X plus Y plus Z really is just your, your X. So this right here is an ideal graph that no one's, I mean, if you get it, great, great. If you don't get it, don't be upset because this is a really perfect graph here. So what else are we gonna see in this, right? So that's this, this light blue line, which you can see right here, you can see that right here. That is what the, what the amplitude of this signal is going to be after the shaper is applied, right? So if I apply a shaper, if I apply the ZV shaper, which is, it says with ZV applied, if I apply the ZV shaper to this spike, the resulting signal is going to be this light blue one down here. That's good, right? So I've taken something with the power spectral density of 6e to the 4, and I've dropped it down to, what is that, 2, 4, maybe 6, 6 e to the 4. I've just knocked that thing down. That's going to mean less ringing in your print. Hopefully zero ringing. Ringing, ghosting, vibrations, they're all the same thing, right? With the different names, exact same thing, right? So then what does Frix also do? Frix uh, understood that... Sometimes people are going to fret or worry about the smallest little hump here, right? So he put it in a, a relaxed region. So the, the light green is a relaxed region. If you've got a signal bouncing around here, just relax. Just relax. Just take it easy. It's fine. It's too low in amplitude to be doing anything major, right? If you've got something here in the, the next region down, this is like this, was that like a, a light peach kind of color? That's the warning region. All right, still relax, still relax. It's not nothing to fret about. It's it could be a problem, but chances are it's it's just just letting you know, just letting you know. You might want to watch out for that. When you start and this these these regions here are based upon the maximum amplitude of your spike. So if your spike goes higher and higher, let's say this is e to the six. This might come up more. You might see more. If this drops down, it might get really big. You know, it changes. So I, I'm not exactly sure on the math that Fricks did, but I know that these are a percentage of your main peak. So that's what those are. If we jump over here, so 
standard clipper gives you five shapers. ZV, MZV, EI, two hump EI, three hump EI. They're all listed here, right? For, for our purposes of 3D printers, don't use ZV. It is too narrow of a shaper. What do I mean by that? Your printer is, once you run these tests, you're just getting a snapshot of your printer in time. As you heat them up, you cool them down, you run them real fast, you run them real slow, things move on you. Things change. Belts expand, right? Metal parts expand. Things contract when they cool. ZV is, is kind of like a scalpel. It just goes in there and it's like, I'm going to take out just this peak. Well, if things move on you and naturally, things will naturally drift. You'll be out of that ZV in no time, right? Your ZV, it, it was this. So this one says, well, when we go through it, it's at a certain frequency. It's canceling. But if things move on you, your spike may not change. Your, your peak may not change, but it may shift in frequency. ZV doesn't account for that right zv you're you're not moving so let's talk about these shapers let's go we'll start here and we'll work through our numbers each shaper here has a different color or type of line so we can see that the blue the line dot with the blue is zv so this right here is zv you can see that it's like a scalpel because it's coming down it's canceling out this main peak and it's and it's going away so this is this effectively is all the frequency it's going to ca cancel, and you can see that reflected in the light blue line. If this peak, as I said, if this peak changed, so like now instead of going here, it starts coming up here. You're not canceling it anymore. It's only going to cancel say half the signal, so that this thing will now go up like this until it crosses this line. So that's why we don't use ZV. The perfect, the 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 most optimal shaper and standard clipper is mzv and, and and we'll talk about why in a bit so the next graph down is mzv it's the orange one orange yellowish with just dots right so the rest of these are just dots it goes like this it comes down and then it goes up a bit in a hump and then goes away you can see that it's got a wider area of effect right so it has a little hump here that it's not going to cancel as good as ZV, right? But it's going to take a wider, wider, be able to cancel more of a, a, a peak. If it's over here, if it moves on you a little bit, it'll be able to take care of it. It has other benefits too, and that we'll talk about. So EI is, if you can't get MZV, you do EI. EI, they all start, so they're all going to start here, and it's how they change along this path. EI is going to come down here and it's going to do a little hump here and then go here. So it actually looks like a narrower shaper, but it has other side effects that we'll talk about. All right after that, two hump EI, two hump EI tries to cancel two signals. But basically, effectively, it's trying to cancel two frequencies. So if you've got a hump here, and then you got another hump over here. It's going to try to cancel because it's really wide. It goes from here, does a little curve there, and comes up here. Three hump EI, it's what it says. It's going to try and cancel three humps. You don't want to use two hump and three hump if you can, if you can help it. And, and the reason it will be apparent shortly. So let's see if we can't blow this up a little more and we'll, we'll jump in there because it's getting kind of hard to read. Okay, so what do we have? How do we read this, this part here? We have the shaper name, the frequency, a vibration number, an SM number, which is smoothing, and, an ex and a recommended max Excel. So let's we'll take our ZV here. ZV, it says to put in 55.4 hertz. That's going to be basically the center frequency of ZV. The vibration, if you use ZV on this graph, even though it's a perfect peak, you will still be left with 1.1% vibration. What does that mean? It means you're, you're, you potentially are still going to have ringing or ghosting on your print. 
not something you want. Whereas if you were to drop down to MZV, you can see that vibrations is zero. So what is this telling you? It tell, it's telling you, yes, you, you can use ZV. And one benefit of ZV is over here, this very last thing we'll talk about, and that's acceleration. The shapers, as the highest shaper ZV, though, what, we're going back, so much to talk about here. We'll start with SM, and then we'll do the whole thing. SM is smoothing. So on your benchies, on the back of a benchie, you have that lettering that never seems to come out right. Well, if you're using a shaper, it's going to smooth over that. And this is the smoothing number. So it's going to do 0 0.06 smoothing, right? So it's going to smooth that print out a bit. The next number is acceleration. This is the max maximum acceleration that Clipper says you can do and still have these numbers, right? So it's basically saying, I'm, if you do this, I think, I think, it's not guaranteeing, it's saying, I think we can get this out of you. We can get 1.1% vibration and only 0 0.6 smoothing. Okay, that sounds great but you still got vibrations. You drop it down a level, MZV, you get zero vibrations. I get the, almost the same, if not the same smoothing, but I'm gonna lose 3000 Excel. So this is this is another another kind of thing when you, when you really wanna dig into input shaping and you're like, okay, I'm gonna do it. You gotta ask yourself, what's your goal? Is your goal to print this thing as fast as possible, to print the fastest under 30 second Benchy? Or is your goal to get the best prints possible at a reasonable speed and acceleration? So for me, I'd rather get the, the I'd rather do the trade off for a best speed at a reasonable acceleration and, and leave the speed benches to somebody else. MZV says, look, I'll get you zero. I'll get you no ringing. But you gotta drop. You gotta drop your Excel. And if you look at EI, EI says I'll get you no ringing, but I'm gonna have to smooth your part out a bit. So I'm gonna those sharp, crisp edges. I'm gonna smooth them out a bit more, and I'm gonna drop your Excel even more. Now, if you if you if you can't get the zero vibrations in MZV, you take EI. That's what you, you know what, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll take that deal. Yeah, I, I'm not going to chase my, my tail, I'll, I'll just take these zero, zero vibrations, but yeah, I'll have to drop my Excel. Now, for this graph, not so much, but you don't want two hump and three hump, because now your smoothing is going to jump. So the trade-off here is, you will still get rid of your vibrations in these, but we're going to drop your Excel even more, and we're going to increase the smoothing of your print. So it's not really, yeah. So as you up here, you're going to get the least amount of smoothing and the fastest Excel using the shaper, but you're going to get vibrations. As you go down, okay, you, you lose Excel, you gain zero vibrations. And you may get a little bit of smoothing. But then as you continue to go down, trying to get those zero vibrations, you're going to give up both smoothing and Excel. All right, so that's that's what this is kind of telling you. You'll know that your graph, that your system, uh, kind of a sanity check is, if your system is right, what you will see is you will see the vibrations go down, right? So it'll start at high and it'll go down all the way to zero or hopefully a low number. Your accelerations will go down, but your smoothing value will go up. If you see jumps, but it's usually between MZV and EI, if you see a jump in Excel, so like I go from like 12,000, let's say I went down to 5,000, and then back up to 8,500, there's something wrong going on in your system that you've got to sort out. Because these numbers should, Excel should go down, smoothing should go up, and vibration should go down. All right, so what's the next thing that this thing's telling you? It's recommended shape. So this is the recommended shaper that Clipper gives you. So Clipper is saying use ZV, but we don't want to use ZV because we're going to get vibrations. So what does Frix do, right? One of the benefits is Frix comes in, he does his own math on this thing. He says a recommended low vibration shaper, and he says use MZV. He's looking for the zero. Clipper's not looking for the zero. Clipper, I think, is looking for the fastest Excel. It's like doing like a trade-off and what I don't know what it's doing. 
The next thing he gives is an estimated damping ratio. And that's based off this peak and, and uh, the square root of the peak over 2, I think 0.707 of the peak value. And you find that and you can do some math and you get your damping ratio. What is damping ratio? All right. So damping ratio, let's look up here, damping ratio, images, boom. We, this is, this is, a, this is a good picture here, right? This explains it. So this is substitute. So this is different damping, right? So if you have a, this is how your signal is going to react to an input signal, right? Clipper sets it at 0.1 by default, right? So we're actually up here. So this is zero and this is two. So we're up here. So our system is going to go up here and then it's going to do a slight under ringing and then come in, right? So this is this is what we're this how the how the input shaper is going to react, kind of thing like it's settling, right? It's ringing. Uh, you can you can do a whole deep dive in it, but this is basically it's reaction. Uh, you think of it like that. Clipper sets this thing at point one by default in their shapers, but what we know is that core X Y vorons can do half that. The benefit of setting that is you're going to get a better response time out of these and a better setting out of these shapers if you use the, the estimated damping ratio, which is calculated from your input shaper, your, your actual system's response. Um, you could, you could, if you want to, don't leave it out. You could run the test and see which one produces a better result. Generally, for both X and Y, you're going to get around a half of what Clipper sets it at. So you're just going to get a more accurate shaper, let's say. So that's that. What's down here? This whole spectrogram thing. I, you know, to be honest with you, I, I know when it's not right, but I don't necessarily know what it means. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking for all these harmonics, which I believe they're harmonics. It's response over time. You want them in like this fan shape, right? And these little ghosty things. Right, you don't really care about them too much, except when one is solid. So let's say 120. Let's say this this one right here was like bright purple, bright orange, like it stood out. Well, what's that mean? That means you had a fan on during your test, right? If it's over here at about 125 hertz, uh, somewhere around here. You, you had something like really big. So these are all kind of like the vertical lines are kind of like the constant frequency, something that's always there. These come into play when they start getting crazy on you in the back. So I know the LIS 2DW doesn't have the same response as, as uh, the ADXL. Uh, and this thing down here looks disco. Right, and what we know right now, at least currently, as of the, the taping of this, is that it adds an offset to your input shaper, which is not a problem if you have a graph that looks like this. But if you have a graph that's got spikies all over someplace else, and you don't know what's real and what's not because it's adding an offset, and then this thing's going to look like a disco light show. Um, what you're looking for here is if you start getting like pieces of a fan, like say here you just had like a, a horizontal thing or over here you had a, you're going to want to start looking at like, okay, what else is going on in this system, right? What's shaking at 50 Hertz at a, after a hundred seconds that's causing that, right? So this, this is a kind of a diagnostic tool when looking at this graph doesn't work or you're wondering what's causing this peak over here, and you look down here, and you say, oh, well, that's solid. I guess I had a fan on. Yeah, I did have the hot end fan on. Maybe I should turn it off. So that's kind of what this is. This guy, so that's how to read this graph. Now the third graph is vibrations graph. So what is this, what, what do we, what do we, besides the input shaping, what do we get from the, the, Besides the variables to put it into Clipper to get input shaping, what else do we get from the this input shaper graph? You're going to get an X and a Y value for acceleration. You're going to choose the least 
the lowest of those two. So let's say you had MZV for X and MZV for Y, and Y comes back at 4,800 um, Excel, and X comes out at 10,000 Excel. Well, standard Clipper doesn't give you the option to put in an X Excel and a Y Excel. You get one, and that's it. So what input shaper will tell you is the Mac to the, you will pick, usually it's going to be the Y axis and you're going to use that Excel as your max Excel, potentially, you know, potentially your max Excel for perimeters, external and internal perimeters should not go above what input shaper says. If you want to get that vibration at zero. Now I would say, go a couple hundred maybe 500 less than the max to really guarantee because it's all an estimate right you may still if you run it at what this number say 9400 if you run it at 9400 you may still get ghosting so you give it some margin of error you give it a buffer so that's what input shaper can get you it's when you're looking at your your slicer this is going to be the max excel for your perimeters so vibrations. So what do we get here, right? It's another another macro. This is what you've run after you've dialed in your belt shaper and you've dialed in your input shaper, right? This is the last thing you run. And what is this gonna tell you? It is gonna basically tell you your motor noise, right? And what does that mean? Well, as you run your motors at different speeds, they will produce their own vibrations their own noise. That's what these spikes are effectively telling you, right? When I run my system at 50 millimeters per second, the motors are going to be throwing this in. So what do I do? I avoid the peaks. So in this graph here, what you want to do is you want to live in the valleys and avoid the peaks. So you're going to run, this is X, Y, uh, Frix allows you to do it for only X, only Y. You can run A, B, X, Y if you want to take the diagonals into account. And you can run A and B. X, Y is probably good for most people if you want to be a little crazy, if you want to really kind of like dial things in, A, B, X, Y is going to do it. But you're going to get less um, speeds to operate at. So this is an okay graph. I don't know what motors, this is heavily motor dependent. Um, so different motors will produce different things. Running it at a different current or run current will produce different graphs. Uh, generally, we're not switching our run currents on the fly during a print. Um, if you are, I don't know, I haven't tested that. But so this, this is basically saying, he gives us a lot of information. It's the same thing, X, Y, and Z. So we can see that we're getting here at 100 hertz, or 100, 100 millimeters a second, we're getting mainly Y excitation. So our Y axis is kind of like, uh, our Z and X is there. And this whole thing kind of looks like mainly Y. So mainly we're getting a lot of Y excitation going on here. The blue is Z, not too much of that. The red is X, hardly any of that. So in an XY axis, we're mainly on this for this test and these motors and this system, this we're mainly getting Y excitation. So how do we avoid this? Well, we as I said, we stay in the stay in the valleys. So for what I would do, how I would interpret this is for external perimeters, I would be down here in this range. In the 55 to 75, 80, 85 range. I'd probably actually be here at 60 to, to maybe 80. That would be my external perimeters right there. And then for my my internal perimeters, I might be at 125. That looks good to me. Because I don't want to be so close to this, this ramp up. Because it's not, you know, I want to kind of give them, once again, a little margin of error. Um, so I'd be here for my around 125 for my external perimeters. Small perimeters, I might be down here, what is that, about 40 or 37 hertz? I'd be in this one right here. Gap filling, I might be here, right? You kinda, you can basically set your slicer settings from here, right? Uh, infill, I don't care. I'd be anywhere in here, because I don't care what infill looks like, because it's inside the printer. Top layers, 
uh, depending upon what I could do, I'd either be at 75 or, or 25 for my, my topmost layer because I don't want it shaking a bit. You know, all the all the pretty things, all the exterior things, I'm going to be in the valleys, right? For everything I don't care about, I, I'll put it wherever I want. Now, this is going to be limited. What's going to... So this will give you your external and internal perimeters and some other values that you want to set. That's what it's telling you. Right, so down here is the same spectrograph. This is what you should see. The same kind of thing, right? Some sort of frequency from your motors. Like you, These are like the steps. I, I believe these are actually the steps of your motors as it's going through its speed. So then it gets faster and faster. Right? You get all this other stuff. Then he's also giving you a motor frequency profile. This is, this is this bottom chart. He's actually taken this, flipped it, so taking this and found out the going this way, what your frequency of your motor is. You should see for a standard core XY, you should see a single peak. It may be something over here. You may have some like little stuff like this down here shaking, but you should get a, if you are getting multiple peaks, like multiple like high value peaks, you might want to look at your motors. But this is, this is purely informative right as you can see there's it's 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 not a troubleshooting thing yet but from what i've seen so far standard core xy you want a single peak single main peak i should say you don't want it looking like kind of like this you want a main peak um so that's this so let's look at some real examples of my crappy machines okay so this is my it's a vt 1190 it's my pink i believe yeah it's my my bubblegum colored one um it is my test bench let's put it that way it's where i start breaking my machine to figure out what's going on and how to read these graphs so this when you run it right let's see frix x he's going to give you these these right here he's going to give you excite at freak that's another macro or if you're getting a problem on one of your input shaper or belt shaper graphs, you can just excite this frequency. It'll take A, B, X, and Y as your axis. You tell it the frequency, and you tell it how many seconds you want to do. When you do the frequency, it will do, I believe, a frequency below and a frequency above. So right now it's at 25 hertz. If I put in, 20, uh, it'll do 24 to 26 and it'll do like each frequency for like right now at 10 seconds by default. Generally, I will have this thing run when I want to excite it frequency. I'll excite it for like 45 seconds. Uh, so I'll hit the main peak where I think is the peak. I'll excite it for 45 seconds, and I'll start. I'll do that a couple times so I can start figuring out where that sound is coming from, what part of the system. You get belt shaper, axis shaper vibrations, and you get this axis map calibration. Um, so in clipper let's go back to those 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 graphs so these axes here these are arbitrary as far as clipper is concerned you can relabel these anything you want it doesn't affect the values it generates like this may be labeled y even though you're exciting x so if you if you look at what axis is doing the main peak is generally going to be that axis if this is green and, and you're doing X and you're like, oh, it, says, it says it's Y, uh, it's probably because your axis labels are wrong. Your ADXL is, is angled in a different way. It happens. Uh, if, it's, if it's too confusing for you, you can run the axis map um, calibration and it will give you a file. Uh, I, I haven't run it. It gives you a file in, in your belt shake tune results that says axis map. It's a text file. You open it up, you put that in Clipper, and you're good to go. And it'll clean that up for you. And then so you get axis map. Uh, okay, so that's that. So belt shaper, we'll look at some real life ones. Uh, this was one of mine. It looks like crap. I've got a little crown here, and I got a solo adventurer, right? So. <clears throat> These two alone aren't a big problem, right? I know I've got the frequencies are about 3.1 hertz out here. 
and it's a 45. So I tighten the belt. What I think is happening here, my, I think my, my, my belt, the B belt is either too loose or A belt, the B, no, sorry, A belt's down here. A belt is either too loose or B belt is too tight. And I'm thinking B belt's too tight because I got this spike over here at 125. So we would go to a different one. Oh, it calmed down, right? So B is still too loose. I fixed some other stuff. And I got this over here, so that's telling me something I gotta look at. Not quite sure if it's a tool head or it's just some binding somewhere. Who knows? I should know, but we gotta keep playing with it. So then we've got a whole bunch of resonance. So this is my last Y I ran. Um, this is obviously not good, but we can we can we can say okay, well, what do I want to do? All right? Is is this good? Right? Should I be? Well, if I look over here at the at the uh, at the um, legend, I can see even EI gives me 0 0.2. That's no good. I gotta clean this up. I probably have a loose screw somewhere. Um, I'm sure this thing is racked. Uh, I've been playing around with it, putting new X Y joints on it. And, yeah. So we can see that this is not this, and the what's kind of interesting is that this peak one is actually the peak I want this peak two that's the problem peak the problem peak and we can see that because well what I know is that and core XY and, and vorons your y-axis is always around here 35 to 40 something or other it's always around here your main peak and Y. so this is the problem pink uh, pink the problem peak that I got to figure out. But you can see, even with this terrible graph, damping ratio, 0 0.67, 0 0.067. What does X look like? Ah, a little bit better, a little bit better. I'm getting zero MZV. So this is a problem. And I'm saying it's a problem because I know when I tune the system in that this is going to be gone. But this is uh, effectively my tap. Or it could be my, um, and it's probably my tap. I gotta fix all that. Once again, this is a system I break to figure this stuff out. But yeah, so, but it, it so this is not this is not even the most recent update, right? This is an older one, but the, you can still see the damping ratio. So that's, it's not crazy. So if this starts going up on you like 0.97, it means your peak's getting wider. Something's not right. All right, so let's look at another another system I got. Just give you some. Oh wait, we didn't look at the um, the vibrations. So in this one, I just have X and Y. So you can see, not great, not great. But these these are where my valleys would be, right here. So this. This is the last one you run because this, once you get the, if you get rid of some binding on your system, right? Like if you fix your belt shapers, your input shapers, I'm most of this, some of the stuff will go away, right? So like this peak here will go away. This peak here will go away. This will kind of calm down in here, but I'll still be left with these two main peaks in here. And you can see that the motor is still one main peak, even though it's got some craziness going on, but that's okay. It's, it's fine. Informative. But this once I clean up input shaper, I will get rid of my system will work better and it'll look better. Let's see if I have a better one to show you. Oh, that's still ugly. So let's go to a different system. Why not? They're all different. So we'll go here. Look at that. Same kind of thing going on here. I think this is also one of the belts is hitting the XY joint. Um, I have to verify that. I have that problem a lot with the way I, I, I don't know what I'm doing building my systems, but a lot of times my belts will hit the XY joint. They'll rub up, up against it. Um, and this is kind of what you'll find sometimes. You'll get this happening. Do I have a better graph? Let's see. Oh, see? It's gone there. It's diminished. But I usually end up with graphs like this. For me, this this graph, I would say, yeah, it's good enough. Right? I, I, I've learned to, to just figure out what's good enough and move on. I've spent countless nights trying to mess with this to get perfect i just 
drives you crazy. All right, so that's kind of the belt shaper on this one. This is the uh, 796, a VT 796. This is, uh, what is this one? This is my purple one. It's my first tried it. Uh, let's see here. Let's just look at this. So we saw my crazy belt shapers, right? Remember these things? Crazy belt shapers. Uh, where's the, what did my input shapers look like? That is not bad. Not bad. I'm probably going to have some issues on my diagonals, you know, with that sh that uh, belt shaper. Probably going to have a little slight issues, but, you know, X and Y, X looks, or Y looks good. This right here, this is probably going to be my umbilical. And I can tell that because it's got Z in it. In Y, if you get a Z somewhere around, somewhere around here, um, it's usually indicative of not necessarily a Z movement per se, but a rotation around the Y axis, an RY rotation that's manifesting as Z. So if I have this, if I have, um, let's say I have a skyscraper, right? And the skyscraper is, is in a big old earthquake and it's bowing back and forth, back and forth, or like a ship back and forth. Well, that's not pure Y movement, right? It's not actually moving forward. It's, Part of it's moving forward, but the Z, it looks like a zero a Z movement, and so that's what you're seeing, and that's why <clears throat> I got some uh, some Z movement there, and it's just a rope. It happens with umbilicals where, and that's actually something you'll see in some of these people's graphs is you'll see a big spike here with a lot of Z movement, and usually the corrective action is take a look at your umbilical, to see how you you've wired it up, and is it applying stress to the tool head. This is once again in the relax or the warning region, you know, just, just, just letting you know it might be a problem, but I'm able to get zero uh, vibrations and it does print pretty good in the Y. X, X looks great. You know, I'm getting 0% smoothing, I get 14, 100, like, I, I, yeah, but I have this for belt shaper. Right, so should I keep trying to figure out belt shaper? Uh, I'm, I'm going to go no, no. I know it's a problem. I know it's a problem. I know it's going to be a problem in certain angles, certain models. I know I'm going to see resonance if it's at a pure angle going into a to a corner. Uh, I know I'm going to see something there. Hopefully, it's a small small shot. I will get something because of this. But it's not worth it for me to troubleshoot this, especially when I know for the vast majority I'm getting this or I'm getting this, right? It's a trade-off. I don't need all my graphs to be perfect. I just need the end result to be good enough. Um, I'm not chasing perfection here. I have tried it. It's driven me bonkers. So, yes, this is why... We'll probably talk about this in the belt shaper uh, video, but you have to know when to stop and you have to know, okay, I'm here. I've been futzing with this thing for a good two hours. I'm not getting rid of this. What do I do? Uh, move on. Just move on. You know, to run input shaper. See where you're at. Take a break. This stuff will drive you nuts if you let it. And, and, and if these are tools. They're not always right. You know, because you could have really crappy graphs and still get good prints. These are just tools to try and help you to figure out how to tune your printer better. But I got this. I was frustrated. You can see how many times I ran this thing. Right? I just ran it, ran it. Let's put the dates on. I mean, this is the last one. Right? It's the last one. And I was getting other stuff. I was getting this. And I'm like, I got to get rid of this. I got to get rid of this. I get to this. You know? And I was like, you know what? Screw it. Let's just move on. Well, I moved on. And I got... Well, that's my that's the vibration. We'll get to that. I moved on. And I got... What is this? Still, what, what kind of over vibrations? Input. There we go. 19. I got this. So I'm like... You know, I... So 
don't get frustrated if you if you're at a point your your belt shaper is not getting better just move on to input shaper see where that's at is it a problem all right the biggest thing on uh, belt shaper is it's just giving you the relative movements of your a belt to your b belt and that's about it yes it can tell you certain things that may happen uh, on diagonal prints but it's just it's, yeah you try not to put too much faith into it you can tell when it's really off right you can tell when someone's really off and, and we'll talk about that in belt shaper but don't get hung up on belt shaper move on get your input shapers because they may actually be good so that's that and then these is my vibrations as i'm sure we've already seen i mean that's damn good that is damn good St this is a stock motors on an ldo kit uh 300 ldo 300 you can see now this is these are the valleys you want to be in see that those val that's a lot of room to be working in stay away like 100 everyone always goes to 100 for a lot of things that's actually one of the worst speeds to use because 100 a lot of this a lot of these uh, vibrations measurements you'll see 100 is actually a bad a bad uh, speed you want to be like 115 to 125 but you know so so these would be this area would be my external perimeters this area here would be my um, internal perimeters and and other stuff over here is where I do my gap fill, my my small perimeters, my um, you know whatever you wanted to go slow. Uh, maybe your first layer is here. Your I mean your first layer could be at 50 because no one cares what it looks like, right? You, you're not going to care about a single layer having noise on it, you know. So you any one of these could be you know first layer. But yeah, and this is this is you can see all all nothing nothing major coming up. Right? No. So I had no fans on. So that's kind of the overview of this. Um, and what you'll do. Oh, wait. Here's one. We have an ABXY. Okay. So when you do ABXY, you're doing X and Y movement. So it does a box, right? It does, an, it does a, just a, a left, forward. It's like a box dance, right? It's just dancing around in a box. When you add AB to it, it does diagonals also. So it does a box, and then it goes diagonal, diagonal box diagonal right it's doing its dance and this is what you end up with usable speeds this this is generally what it will look like you will have a smidgen of a room here smidgen of a room smidgen and then here you're usually good because your a b's right so this right here was my x for my x y this is my x y this is my x y three and five that's from the AB direction. So when I run this thing in AB in diagonals, I get different uh, noise from the motors because I'm only running one motor at a time. And so I'll get these different um, different noises and it leaves you really with hardly any room. So if you really wanted to, to try to reduce your motor noise or your, your, the, the, the vibrations caused by your motors generally, less you're going to have very fine areas to run in what this means though is in the slicer you're going to have to disable cool times or minimum cool times or minimum layer times um, because the slicer is going to take you out of this right because it's going to say you you have to be on a layer let's say you have to be on a layer for 20 seconds right? that's your minimum layer time well in order to do that it's going to have to slow you down on certain things. So you're going to have to, if you really want to like dial this thing, like I only want to use this frequency right here, you've got to disable minimum layer time, which may actually have a more of a detrimental effect to your print because you need to cool it. Right? Even ABS has to have some sort of fan sometimes. So just be careful saying, oh, you know, Reth said I can... I, I'll, I'll, I'll just really, you know, tune my speeds to only this. Well, y yeah, but something else in the model may not work out. And, and really what we want is good prints. We don't want good graphs. We want good prints. And trying to, trying to 
you know, so that's why this is informative, right? It's informative. Like, okay, so if I put my perimeters at, let's say, 80, right? My perimeters at 80, my external perimeters there, even if I have slowdowns, this is what it's going to try. This is what I'm shooting for because I know that's good value. And, and you can go back to your X, Y, and get like, okay, if I go here and it slows it down, I still, in X, Y, I still have all this room. It's only going to be the diagonal, so maybe I don't put my printer on a diagonal. Maybe I'm trying to maximize its time it's printing on the A or on the X or Y axis. Conversely, if you want to put everything at a 45 because you always want the, the seams at the back, you're not going to run X, Y. You're going to run the A, B axis only. And that way you can use those values because you're like, most of the time I'm printing, you know, uh, uh, parts and parts are generally squarish. And so I'm always going to have every, a straight line on an ink, on a, on, a, on a diagonal. So let's do that. So it really comes down to what you're printing. So if you want to, you can run a, X, Y. And then you can have another graph for AB and another graph for ABXY. And so you can kind of tune your print for the speed based upon the orientation. And you can say, okay, well, you know, if we go back to the, the ABXY, oh, we have AB. So there we go. Let's close this out. We have AB. There's AB, right? So if, I, if I'm printing everything on a diagonal, I might say, well, crap, it's really good. So I'll put my perimeters at 100, external and internal. Because I'm on the AB axis, that's not a problem. So you can use this in that kind of sense that you can use these graphs based upon how you orientate your model on the plate to figure out the optimal speed generally for the print. And now, once again, if you start having organic shapes, right, where... where Maybe you're printing, I don't know, uh, something with an organic, a dinosaur, right? You're printing a dinosaur, right? Well, it doesn't really have, it's not structural. So it's not going to have a diagonal on A, B axis or a diagonal or a straight line on X, Y axis. So in that sense, if you're printing something organic, I would use the X, Y axis because you're going to be doing a lot more X, Y movements than you will A, B movements. And, and that's because the way Clipper does curves, which are organic, is that they are an X and a Y movement. They're not a curve per se. So an X and Y movement is two motors. A and B movements are a single motor. So if you're doing structural things where only one motor needs to go, you might want to use this. If you're doing organic shapes or, or shapes with a lot of X, Y movements, I wouldn't go this route. I would just do the, the standard X, Y. And, and do it that way. Hopefully I'm clear uh, on that. So that's <clears throat> that's kind of shake tune and, and, and input shaper as a part one, as an introductory. Um, we're not really getting into too much troubleshooting this one. That's going to be in part two with belt shaper. We'll go into some troubleshooting with belt shaper. Um, I'm going to stress again, don't get sucked into this all too much. And when in doubt, do a test print. You always need to print this stuff afterward because you've got to verify what the data is giving you is correct. And what we care about is the prints, not the graphs. Even though sometimes I like the graphs a lot, I do care. But the alt the end result is the print. So what I like to tell people when they're, they're coming to me for help or they're asking for help, run me belt shaper, run me input shaper, run me vibrations calibration, and do me a print. I want a Voron cube, three perimeters, zero top, zero infill, say three to four bottoms, and I want pictures of all four sides of that cube. And I want all that data up front. And the reason I want all that is I want to baseline this system, right? If we're going to start messing with it, we need to know where it's at now. And that's, that's the best way to do that. Because, or else what happens is we start catching our tail. And, I, and I've done it recently where I've caught myself and like, why didn't I ask for this information? But that's what you need. You need to baseline the system. Just, just run all the tests, print a cube, um, and then come back and say, okay, my print has ghosting. My graph says this. What do I need to do now? 
and that's that's a much better way to troubleshoot the, these graphs than to show just say hey my belt shaper looks like this what do i do my input shaper looks like this what do i do even if you come to me and you say my my my, my um, print looks like this what do i do right I, I can't one of those pieces i'm missing information you got to you got to have it all so you do get all the information, and then it's easier to figure out what's going on. Um, anyway, so that's the introductory. I um, hope you enjoyed the show, you know. And uh, see you next time for part two. Part three is going to be a, a uh, uh, troubleshooting with Input Shaper. Um, I don't think we're going to go over uh, vibrations calibration anymore. I think that this was actually a pretty good dive into it. And it gave you everything you need to know it's not really a troubleshooting it's more of an informative graph um, so uh, part two will be belt shaper part three will be input shaper and and troubleshooting techniques with that and then um, we might have some other people send me graphs and you know want to know my suggestions on where i would go with it um, i would ask that you send me um, once again send me input shaper belt shaper and a voron cube um, force uh, zero infill, zero uh, tops, three perimeters, and like four bottoms. It doesn't matter the bottoms, but whatever makes you comfortable. And then run vibrations calibration. Send me all that data. You can uh, message me in Discord. Uh, it's Reth. It's really easy on the Voron Discord, uh, the original Reth. Reth. Um, message me there. I'll be in some, I'll generally be lurking around the residence channel. And, uh, yeah, send me, send me, meet me, you know, hit me up there and, and we can take a look. All right. Uh, have a good night.